um, you had huge returns in silver and in gold. Gold was up from memory, about, I believe it was 1,400%. So 14 times from, from say, 70, 71 to 1980. You had silver up, I believe it was 3,600%. So 36 times. I think that's something that's really sort of key to understand. Um, gold in particular has been so impressive because if you think about some of the headwinds that gold has faced this year, you know, we've had rates um, really high, have been sustained high. The Fed until at least the last meeting has been talking um, quite, um, quite hawkish and uh, that it's going to be higher for longer, all that sort of thing. Um, then, so with that, you've you've had until again recently a relatively strong dollar. You've had um, bonds with you know providing some pretty high yields. At one point, I think it was um, in November, early November, we had near the entire uh, treasury um, market. Uh, all the maturities were above uh, at or above five percent, which was huge. And so these are big headwinds and stocks started to do well. So broader, the broader market. So these are all pretty strong headwinds for, for gold and silver. Gold, as I say, really held up uh, particularly strong, strongly. And, um, that, that was quite surprising and, uh, and quite welcome. Uh, and I think that one of the big reasons, if you think about having all these headwinds and staying that strong, you kind of have to ask yourself what what's driving that, and so I think the the answer mainly to that has been central bank buying. I think last year the, it was a record year, and and by far outpaced any previous year. So we were at about a thousand eighty or a thousand eighty three tons of gold um, bought by central banks, and this year we're on pace to to nearly match that, somewhere around a thousand um, tons again for twenty twenty three. So that's been massive buying by central banks. Uh, so I think that the physical market has been very much supported by, by that kind of buying. And I think that's what has kept gold so close for so long to somewhere around the $2,000 level. And now we're comfortably above it. Um, again, very bullish. I think we're going to see a strong year for um, for gold and by extension, silver for similar and as well as uh, for some different reasons. I think what happens is that people forget that the precious metals are, are kind of much like the stock market. So they tend to sense w what's coming a certain uh, length of time in advance. And so if you look at the 70s, I think that when when you saw these these uh, considerable rises, it came in waves. It wasn't obviously a straight line up, but when it when it came and it came in waves, it was in anticipation of of rate hikes and the and into some extent uh, because they knew that um, uh, the the Fed was uh, hiking rates in order to fight inflation, and they knew that eventually that was going to have to stop because it, it was they were going to relatively achieve their goal, which was to sort of slow things down in terms of the economy. And what comes after after that is is rate cuts. So uh, I, I think the precious metals senses that cycle, and so starts to price it in. And so, you know, I, I was actually, I've been asked, you know, in the last sort of few weeks, what I thought for next year. And, and one of the things I do think is that if we start to get uh, rate cuts, let's say roughly by about mid-year, I would not be surprised. And, and I'm not going to right now say from what level specifically, but I would not be surprised to see um, precious metals actually start to uh, uh, dial back a little bit at that point, because a lot of that will have been priced in and it's going to be by the rumors, sell the news. So when the news comes, um, the precious metals, which will have most likely priced in these cuts, will say, okay, you know, I knew this was coming. Now it's come. And um, and so the, they'll, they'll back off. Um, again, I don't think necessarily too much, but I could see that you know, we could get a bit of a lull in mid year, and then I think. Uh, but overall, it'll it'll pick back up, and it'll be a, probably a strong first, both and second uh, and second half of uh, of twenty twenty four for both uh, for for both precious metals. I, I think we're going to head into a similar period, which was a period of stagflation, which until the seventies, economists thought could not happen, it could not exist, and that's where you have. A slow economy, you have high inflation, and you have high unemployment, and so um, we have we have um, not had two of those yet. So the economies remained pretty resilient, but there was a ton of 
of uh, printing that took place, you know, in the wake of, of the COVID pandemic. And um, we, so we've had the inflation part. We've, we have not had the, uh, the high unemployment and, um, you know, I think that what, what's likely to happen is that the uh, the effect which took place in the seventies was that you always had a lag, but the but the central banks would start to raise rates, and then you'd have this. And in fact, it, interestingly enough, there's a great chart by uh, by the people at press at Chris Cat, uh, Teddy Costa specifically, that shows the seventies shows the the uh, these three successive waves actually. So it goes it goes up in the late sixties, early seventies. It, it comes back down, and that's because the central bank, uh, the Fed, hikes rates. And then you have a second wave that's sort of mid seventies. Uh, again, the the bank uh, central bank raises rates. And then backs off, so you have um, you have inflation come up and then back off, and then in, in the very late seventies up until nineteen eighty, you have these this last massive wave of um, of inflation. That's when you had Volcker really step in and uh, be aggressive in terms of of rate hikes. But there, in this same chart, you have layered on top, you have unemployment, and unemployment actually follows basically the same pattern, but with a lag uh, on average of about two years. So um, here we are. <laughs> we started, you know, the Fed started raising rates in early 2022. Uh, we're close to the start of 2024, say, you know, first quarter kind of thing. And so if you have this a similar time lag, uh, what we might see is start to see unemployment start to hike up. Uh, markedly in the first quarter of 2024. Now, I've got to say, you know, nothing's set in stone and nobody knows for sure. But what you do have this time around that may counterbalance is that you have, um, you do have a smaller pool of workers. And that's something that demographically, uh, I think was quite different in the 70s. So that may actually help sort of uh, temper uh, uh, a spike or a considerable rise in, in unemployment. But um, we certainly, I mean, I, I think that the reason that we're going to see things play out similar to the way they were in the 70s is that, um, again, uh, you may not have quite the level of unemployment, but I do think you're going to have inflation that's going to continue. I think this is going to be an inflationary decade, um, lack of of uh well, you're going to have a. You could easily have a uh, um, a wage price spiral. Um, you could certainly have, uh, or you could argue that you're going to have uh, ongoing shortages and 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 tightness in terms of supply of all sorts of of, of materials and especially anything sort of relating to commodities because there's been underinvestment for at least a decade, and. Um, so you're going to really, I think, have the ingredients for a period of, of stagflation. And that's why I think that oh, for in general, broadly, I think we have the right conditions for precious metals to continue to do well and to perform the way the, well and the way that they did in the 1970s. And so and I do have a chart that I've used you know, over the last few years, also, again, in the book that shows how um if you uh, if you look at where the Dow, for example, and the S and P were, I think it was roughly 1970 to 1980, um, you had huge returns in silver and in gold. Gold was up from memory about, I believe it was 1400 percent, so 14 times from, from say 70 71 to 1980. You had silver up, I believe it was 3600 percent, so 36 times from 71 to 1980 and and without accounting for inflation you had uh the S&P and the Dow were basically flat so over 10 years you know if you held the index either the S&P or the Dow you were essentially flat over 10 years and and gold gave you 14 times return silver silver gave you 36 times return on your money so I mean that's a really really you know strong argument for if nothing else to at least have some exposure to these um to these to the precious metals to 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 bring you some diversification and not really completely rely on uh, on stocks and and bonds are or something else completely <laughs> I mean if we and I do think that we're going to continue to have um Yes, the Fed will likely start cutting. Central banks will start cutting. Uh, you know this this coming year, 
But I do think that um, we're not going to get back down to these, you know, 2% uh, inflation targets, at least not for any kind of extended period of time. I think we're going to, we are going to continue in a, uh, in a, uh, a period of, uh, of extended inflation. And that um, with that, um, we are going to see, uh, we are going to see the, the, the stock markets suffer and, and likely, you know, dramatically underperform. So again, I think, you know, here, uh, you don't have to be all one thing or the other, but, um, the argument for, for, uh, inflation protection and, you know, precious metals being, uh, essentially the ultimate when it comes to that, um, are very strong for, as I say, at least the rest of this decade.